Good evening. Ram55 here and I'm coming back with another installment of my Kerbal Space Program NASA missions. Now it's been a little while since I've been with you guys and for those of you who have seen them before I started out my uh, program with uh, the launch of satellites and probes including Explorer 1, Vanguard 1, Pioneer 4 and 5 and Echo 1 that spanned a period from February 1st 1958 to August 12th 1960 and I've recreated these missions in the Kerbal Space Program. So I hope you've seen those videos and I hope you enjoyed them. Again, looking forward to uh, feedback from you guys and what you would like to see and how I could do things differently or better. Now, shortly after the uh, launch of uh, Explorer 1 in 1958, the United States looked uh, in earnest towards uh, the goal of put putting a man into space. And that eventually led to a three-stage program. The first stage, uh, was Mercury, the second Gemini, and the third Apollo. Now Mercury had three simple goals set for uh, that program. Number one, to get a man into orbit around the Earth. The second one was to investigate how well human beings could function in the space environment. And number three, to recover the man and the spacecraft safely. Those were the simple goals of Mercury. So over two million people were involved in the program and over the uh, course of four years and eight months they launched 25 missions and six of those were manned flights. There was quite a uh, intense program in, uh, set up to find the type of person who was going to be able to withstand the rigors of space travel and at President Eisenhower's insistence they were all military people, all fighter pilots, um, and they went through uh, tons of testing to pick out the people with the quote-unquote right stuff. The original seven astronauts were um, Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Wally Schirra, and Gordon Cooper. They made the six flights in the uh, Mercury program. In addition, uh, Deke Slayton was also selected as one of the original seven astronauts, be but because of a minor heart murmur, he was disqualified from flight and did not fly in the original Mercury program. However, he did eventually get into space on board the Apollo Soyuz test project. So the United States start, set off in earnest to set up the, uh, the Mercury program. And once again, they felt like they were behind. The Soviets beat us to the punch with the first um, launch successfully of, an, of a satellite around the Earth, and that was Sputnik. So we felt like we were behind. We were a little bit embarrassed by that, and we worked very hard to try to beat the Soviets with the first manned flight. But once again, the Soviets beat us to the punch, and the United States felt like they were falling further behind in the space race. On April 12, 1961, Vostok 1 was launched with Yuri Gagarin on board. He completed one complete orbit and landed successfully on the ground. Now, the interesting thing about his flight is... Um, at about 23,000 feet as it was re-entering the atmosphere, he actually ejected out of the spacecraft and parachuted separately from the spacecraft. So he came down separately, did not get um, out of the spacecraft uh, like the Americans do once they're back on the ground. His flight lasts about 108 minutes. Now the first of the uh, manned space flight uh, for the United States was uh, the first two, I should say, which I'm going to concentrate on tonight, were suborbital missions. They were basically ballistic um, trajectories. They were launched from the Cape. They went up, hit their peak altitude, and then friction with the atmosphere and gravity eventually pulled the craft down, and they uh, landed um, successfully in the ocean. Freedom 7 was the first one. It was launched on May 5, 1961. The first American in space. Uh, was Alan B. Shepard, Jr. His flight, uh, like I said, took off on May 5, 1961, lasted 15 minutes and 28 seconds. The second one, almost an identical flight, a ballistic trajectory, was Liberty Bell 7 on 21 July 1961, and that was piloted by Virgil I. Gus Grissom, and his flight lasted 15 minutes and 37 seconds. So typically what would happen is uh, the countdown would start approximately 24 hours uh, prior to the launch of the vehicles. There was always preparation before that, getting the vehicles assembled and brought out to the space pad. But during that period, um, the 
the electronics were checked, the systems were checked, the vehicles were fueled with their liquid fuel rocket uh, propulsion, and then there was a, a planned hold. Uh, it would go into the next day where the countdown would resume about six and a half hours prior to the, uh, the planned launch time. And about two hours prior to that, the uh, astronaut was uh, taken out to the vehicle and strapped in. Typically, he would get up in the morning, he'd have his uh, traditional steak and egg uh, meal. He would get suited up, transported in a pretty low-tech vehicle. It was a semi-truck with a trailer on the back. He'd get transported out to the vehicle, and I can clearly remember seeing uh, Alan Shepard stepping out of that trailer, taking a few steps out, looking up at his vehicle, holding his hand up to shield his eyeballs from the, the blight lights that were illuminating his uh, Mercury spaceship uh, because there were lots of uh, floodlights on it. And then he would get on the elevator and he was transported up to the top where he proceeded to strap in. And you got to remember, at the time, the uh, success rate for, uh, for launching these things was pretty low, uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% where something would go wrong, the vehicle would blow up, the motors would cut out early, guidance computers would fail, they go off course and they'd have to detonate and blow them up in the air. So these were very brave souls that were strapping themselves into this can on top of the, uh, the spaceship. So everything was going as planned. Uh, Alan Shepard was brought out two hours prior to his launch, and he was uh, uh, brought up to the top of the uh, elevator, got off, and was secured into the uh, spacecraft. And the spacecraft was about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. It was very small, uh, very little room to maneuver on the inside. He had an instrument panel in front of him. He had to kind of wedge himself into a form-fitted seat. Other people had to help assist him into the seat and get uh, strapped in. And the, the countdown went without any glitches. But once Shepard got there and the countdown resumed, a couple problems uh, picked up. Number one, they had to wait for weather. One of the goals uh, and objectives of his mission was to make observations from space. Um, and the weather had moved in and was going to prevent him from doing that. There was too much cloud cover. So they, w they delayed, I think, about two hours to let the weather pass through. Then there was a... Um, an electrical glitch, one of the uh, inverters that was providing power to the, uh, to the launch area uh, broke down. They had to wait for that to be fixed. And then a third glitch, one of the, just before uh, liftoff, one of the tracking computers had to be re uh, rebooted and that again delayed it. So in the meantime, rather than be th being there for two hours, he was actually strapped into his uh, spacecraft and ready to go for about three hours when another crisis arose. It's kind of humorous now looking back at it, but after being there for three hours, uh, poor old Mr. Shepard had to pee. And there was quite a bit of conflict between him and the, uh, the officials back in the uh, command center. And he finally got to the point and said, gents, if you don't let me pee, I'm just going to pee in my suit. Well, that l raised a lot of eyebrows. Um, you got to remember that once the hatch was closed, it was closed with 70 bolts. It would have taken a long time to undo those bolts and get him out have him go to the bathroom and then get back in. So they finally reached a compromise. They turned the electrical uh, sensors off of his suit, let him pee, and everything went pretty smoothly after that. Liftoff finally occurred successfully at 9.34 a.m. It was li watched live on television by millions around the world, including President Kennedy and his, uh, his special guests in the Oval Office. The launch went pretty much as planned, and the two ballistic Mercury missions both had a very similar profile. The uh, launch vehicle boosted the space capsule for about 2 minutes and 23 seconds. At that time, there was main engine cutoff, and after that happened, the uh, emergency ejection tower that was strapped to the top of the um, capsule was jettisoned. There was a 10-second delay and then there was separation between the space capsule and the booster, and that was done by a posigrade rocket, um, and they gave them some separation. Now they were both on a ballistic trajectory. The space capsule went on its way, and there was a, a uh, programmed computer that actually turned the vessel around to a minus 34 degree um, downward pointing angle relative to the horizon, and it also reversed the course of the uh, spacecraft so that it was going with the uh, blunt end or the heat shield first. 
the spacecraft continued to go on its uh, ballistic course and finally reached its apogee or the highest point. And approximately 30 seconds prior to apogee, the retro rockets were fired. Now, for these missions, it was not necessary to bring the spacecraft back down to Earth. It was going to come down regardless, but they wanted to test the systems, uh, make sure everything was working, because once the Mercury spacecraft was in orbit, it was critical that these rockets fire in order to slow the vehicle down, change its orbit, and it would decay K and re-enter the atmosphere. After that, it would come back through the atmosphere. Uh, the uh, air was much denser, and the, because of the velocity of the uh, vehicle, it would uh, slow down, but it would also heat up due to the friction, and it had an, a uh, heat shield placed on the bottom side of the uh, of the capsule that was made of an ablative material that literally burned off and dissipated the heat as they re-entered. Eventually, uh, they would get to the point where they were slow enough, they would um, deploy a drogue chute that would help stabilize the vehicle as well as slow it down further, and then the main chute would deploy, and then it would slowly open up and allow the uh, spacecraft to uh, gently slow down, and it would take the rest of its uh, uh, flight back down to the uh, to the ocean and make a splash landing. Now, when they were airborne, several tests were being done. They wanted to see how well man can control the spacecraft, so they were given different tasks, including changing the pitch, roll, and yaw of the vehicle. They had some observations to make from the window, and all that was done quite successfully with both flights. The time that they spent in space, actually, and weightless, was only about five minutes on their 15 minutes flight. So these people were only in space and weightless for approximately five minutes, but during that five minutes, they became immortal. Now, during the uh, uh, second flight, everything went just as planned as well. There was a slight difference between the two vehicles. The uh, uh, vehicle that um, Alan Shepard flew was the first one. It had the uh, small round portal windows that were on either side of the vehicle. They were about 10 inches across, so not much of a view outside. It also had the hatch bolted in place. Now the second vehicle, piloted by Gus Grissom, called the Liberty Bell 7, had explosive bolts applied to the hatch so he could make a quicker egress if necessary. And there was a, a, uh, a lever on the inside that he had to hit to actually blow the hatch off. There was also a larger window placed in the vehicle as well for better view outside. And that was done at the astronaut's insistence. Rather than being a passenger in a can, they wanted to feel more like pilots and in control. So they had them put a um, larger window in place for them to see outside. Now in Gus Grissom's flight, he was actually very preoccupied actually looking out the, the window, as I would have been as well. It was quite a view, pretty unique to mankind, obviously and he had to really force himself to get back to the tasks at hand. Both of the flights went pretty much as planned. They splashed down as planned, and within minutes of them hitting the ground, the uh, helicopters would move into place. One helicopter would come down. They'd throw a frogman out. He would help attach a cable from the helicopter to the spacecraft uh, for recovery. The helicopter would then partially raise the spacecraft up out of the water and then the uh, astronauts would be extracted. They would remove the hatch and the astronauts would be extracted. A second cable would be lowered with a uh, harness on it. And the uh, astronaut would put himself into that horseshoe collar and be hoisted separately up into the same helicopter. For Alan Shepard, from the time he hit the water to the time he was back on the uh, recovery vessel, which was the uh, USS um, I'm trying to think what it was now. I think it was the Sh uh, Lake Champlain. Um, it was 11 minutes. And for Gus Grissom, it was the uh, USS Randolph, both of them aircraft carriers. Now, the problem with uh, Gus Grissom is once he landed, he was sitting in his vehicle in communication with the helicopters that were already airborne, waiting for him to splash down, sitting comfortably. And while he was in there, he wanted to make some readings off the instrument panel and there was a collar that kind of made a seal around their neck to prevent water from getting in and air from escaping, but uh, that was uh, causing restriction in his movement. He had to actually put his hand up and let some air out so he could maneuver a little bit better and see things better in the cockpit. That became a big issue later because after he copied down that information and he was just waiting for recovery, as he said, 
the hatch just blew. Now that was quite a controversy at the time. Uh, he was sitting in there, hatch blows off. He's sitting in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There's no buoyancy collars on these spacecraft and the water comes slopping in from the ocean into Liberty Bell 7 and it starts to sink. Now fortunately he had already undone his uh, safety belts and his restraining devices so that he was ready for pickup. And once it started to sink, he made a hasty egress. Now the helicopters swooped in rather quickly. They did get a frogman in the water. In fact, at one point, Gus Grissom swam over and helped the uh, frogman attach the collar to his spacecraft, Liberty Bell 7. And uh, in the process of them trying to pick up Liberty Bell 7, because it was so full of water, it was too heavy, they couldn't actually lift it out of the water. The uh, motors on the helicopter were actually being damaged. They had some warning lights saying that there was some metal fragments in the oil and they had to make a decision and they eventually cut loose the Liberty Bell 7 and it sank to the bottom. In the meantime Gus Grissom's over there treading water and because he had loosened the collar up around his neck it was now allowing water to get into his spacesuit and he was finding it more and more difficult to tread water. So while they're over there scrambling to save the Liberty Bell 7 he's over there treading water and essentially he's sinking. Um, he was working really hard to stay afloat when a second helicopter was brought in. Eventually they did get a collar down to him. He put himself in it and he was hoisted safely on board the helicopter and brought back to the USS Randolph. Unfortunately the same could not be said for his vehicle. The Liberty Bell 7 sank to the bottom of the ocean. Now there was a lot of controversy. They said, well, it doesn't just blow, blah, blah, blah. But Wally Shira, who was a colleague of uh, um, Gus Grissom and also one of the original seven astronauts who would make the uh, fifth flight, uh, said, you know, I think he's telling the truth. And to prove his point, when his orbital mission landed and rec uh, came back and splashed down in the ocean, he purposely stayed in the spacecraft until it was safely back on board the aircraft carrier during recovery, at which time he told everybody stay clear. He hit the button, ejected and blew off the, um, blew off the, uh, the um, hatch, and in the process got himself a pretty sizable bruise on his hand. Now, he said if anybody had done this accidentally, they would have had that same bruise and there was no such thing on uh, Gus Grissom's hand. So it, it kind of um, venerated, exonerated uh, Gus Grissom, um, saying that it didn't happen by accident. It really did just blow. So um, in any event, the uh, Liberty Bell 7 went to the bottom. Gus Grissom came back. After recovery, you know, the, the astronauts were treated to some VIP ceremonies. Obviously, all the magazines were out there very interested in their life stories. They were hounding them for um, stories before and after their flights, and they were on the cover of Time magazine, Life magazine, Newsweek magazine, and one of the big things was they would be invited to Washington to meet the president and have dinner. I guess because of the bad publicity around Gus Grissom's, I think, uh, unfortunate experience where his capsule sunk, he did not get the invite, and if you ever watched the movie The Right Stuff, which I highly recommend you doing, you know, there was a lot of controversy and disappointment about that as well. Regardless, um, many, many years later, July 20th, 1999, under, uh, um, from a donation from Discovery uh, TV channel, the Liberty Bell was actually found and recovered from the ocean floor and it was brought back up um, and restored. There was a lot of worry about the corrosion and the effects of being on the bottom for, for as long as it was. It was uh, down there actually for 38 years, but it was in remarkable condition. So they preserved it and there was worry about corrosion once it was back up in the air as well, but they preserved it, restored it, and it is uh, also on display as are all the mercury capsules. The um, Freedom 7 can be seen at the Naval Academy and uh, now that the uh, uh, Liberty Bell has been recovered. It is also on display for the public to come and see. So all the original seven or all the original six manned uh, Mercury space capsules are on display. You can actually go see them if you're lucky enough to get a chance to do that. So that's uh, the introduction into the uh, Mercury space program. I am going to be flying some of the missions. I'm going to be flying all the missions, but I'm going to be making recordings on the highlights of some of them. So rather than do two of the same things, such as the first two suborbital, which I've described today, I'm just going to show you the first one, because the second one is basically a carbon copy of that. And then we'll get into the orbital, orbital mission. So 
I'll give you the highlights from uh, from those missions on the videos that I'll be producing next. So hopefully you'll find them entertaining. Once again, uh, I apologize for the delays in getting videos out to you guys and look forward to producing some more videos in, in various games along the way. But my next video will be the uh, recreation in the Kerbal Space Program of Alan Shepard's flight of Freedom 7. And uh, that'll be coming up next. So hope you enjoy it and we'll talk to you guys soon.